And you can, uh, let's give it a hand uh, clap, firstly, to say thank you. Thank you, Rita and company, for the lovely food. And if you like Rita's details for you to order your next uh, party food, uh, Nid has got it. We want to begin our afternoon session now, so welcome everybody, who's, those of you who just joined us, and thank you to the, to the rest of us for hanging around uh, during the day for this afternoon session. Excuse me. And we've been involved in our, our annual um, challenging hate race, uh, um, hate, crime, hate crime awareness week with the city council. And so this afternoon's program is kind of part of that, um, that work that we engage in, uh, that interfaith work that we engage in twice a year here at the cathedral. So uh, it's very much a cathedral as well as a challenging hate collaboration this afternoon. So challenging hate uh, paid for your lunch this afternoon. Thanks to the city council. Um, I want to just say welcome firstly. Uh, my name is uh, Rogers Governor and I'm the Dean here. Um, so welcome to all of me. It's really good to have you in the cathedral for this event. Today, this race, uh, this uh, challenging, challenging hate event is, is part of a broader, uh, bigger vision for the cathedral's uh, Clarkson Day. My, my colleague, Canon David Holgate, is the chief organizer of this Thomas Clarkson Day. So I want to thank David for all the hard work that he's put into this event. Uh, we've had sort of lovely speeches this morning informing us of what we're doing about modern slavery and so on. Thomas Clarkson, as you will hear just now, I'm sure is, <clears throat> is, is very much about slavery or rather anti-slavery. Um, over 200 years, Clarkson spoke in the cathedral and against slavery. And you'll hear all about that in a short while. And I don't want to get into that too much. Let me just repeat what I said at Chester Cathedral two weeks ago, when I was invited to preach on anti-slavery. <clears throat> Excuse me, I said that you invited me here to speak about slavery and anti-slavery. However, keep in mind I was preaching to an all-white congregation. I said, however, you must remember that when, I sp when anybody speaks about slavery, we cannot forget about slavery's twin sister, racism. Because it is slavery, we know that racism and slavery been around for a long time, but we also know, <clears throat> know that slavery sort of gave even more permission, if you like, for people to be exploited, for people, to, black people to be exploited, abused, and basically treated like, I don't have to tell you, the worst words I can, I can sort of muster. Black lives became expendable, largely fueled encouraged by slavery. So it was quite a tough sort of thing to say in, a, in an all-white congregation virtually, but it had to be said. And some of you, how many of you are cricket lovers here? Cricket lovers? <clears throat> Have you heard the name Quinton de Kock? Yeah, you heard of him in the last few days. Well, Quinton de Kock is a South African cricketer. I'm South African, by the way. Um, and he very recently, a few days ago, apparently refused to take the knee with the rest of the team. Um, I'm not sure who South Africa was playing, was it? Uh, anybody know? With West Indies. <clears throat> so Quentin de Kock, a white member of the South African cricket team, refused to take the knee with the rest of the team. And you can imagine how the rest of the country are feeling about that. The kind of message that Quentin symbolically, representatively gives to the rest of the nation of the world that racism, which is what uh, taking the knees all about, it's, it's, it's protesting against racism and making that, that, that visible um, in our witness, is, is not for white people in South Africa. Now you know why we cannot stop talking about racism. Because racism, even in a place like South Africa, and given all that Mandela has achieved in that country is well and well and well, well over, but actually it isn't. So when we think about Clarkson, slavery, modern slavery, 
let's not forget that all of that leads up to, to, to racism, discrimination, exclusion of every sort. And we in this cathedral, we stand for inclusion of every sort. So that's why my opening sort of comments to us as we gather, was it that Tutu said, you know, we've got to look after people, um, take care of people who are drowning, but we've got to go upstream and see why they're falling into the river in the first place. So we're going to be reflecting on some of that, I'm sure, in our afternoon. With all of those comments, let me say welcome. And I should say entertainment, but it's entertainment. Our, our friend there is here. And she's going to be doing some dance for us. You want to say something about the dance? Namaste. Thank you very much, Reverend Dean. And I should say a big thank you to Dr. Holgate for inviting me to do this and my very special friend, Nindi. Um, my name is Nitya Ramohan, and um, I'm a dancer. I um, do Indian classical dance. Um, the type of dance I, special, I do is called Bharatanatyam. That comes from the southern part of India. Um, says bhava expressions, raga music, and thala um, for the rhythm. Um, more about the pieces I've actually chosen today. The first one I'm going to do, um, it's got its, uh, the verses are actually from ancient uh, Sanskrit texts. It's called the Argala Stotram, but more importantly, talks about um, good over evil. Okay, I'm okay for this. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay for this. Um, so I, I, when this topic was given to me, I felt um, we Hindus celebrated a very special time. Uh, it's called the Navratri. We talk about uh, how the goddess takes a big form and destroys the Mahishasuram, who was a, a demon king. Um, but I see that as racism and hatred. Um, as you know, we've got to rise above everything else and show the courage and the bravery and the strength and fortitude and just believe in who we are. So that's the first piece I've chosen. Um, the flip side of it, the second one I've actually chosen is called the Shanti Mantra. Um, it says, let there be peace everywhere. Let there be prosperity everywhere. Let everybody be happy. Let everybody be in peace. Um, it's called Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina. So I think both have to work hand in hand. We've got to have the courage, but at the same time, I think peaceful coexistence um, works. So I'll give a little bit about the second piece in a minute. The first one, Argala Stotra.
Um, as you may see, lots of hands and faces and legs going on. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of context to what I'm going to do for the second one. So this is the Shanti Mandra. Mantra. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina hai. Sarve Santu Niramaya hai. Sarve Badrani Pashyantu. Let there be peace everywhere. Let there be prosperity everywhere. Let there be happiness everywhere. So, um, just as all the elements and all the creatures all around us thrive hand in hand, um, I think we should, as men and women, and uh, you know, we should also try and be united in what we do. Um, that's what I've done. So, we talk about the moon, the sun the moon <laughs> behind her, and the earth, the sky, wind, water, and we talk about all the creatures, all the birds, and all the creatures, all living together, and men, women, children, and all of us to be united, and no war in us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, 
Thank you, Nia, sir. Ah, there you are. She will be leading us later this afternoon in a Bollywood presentation and hoping that we will also uh, get our mojos out or whatever we do as we thank you. It's so inspiring to see the human body moving in such a disciplined and uh, beautiful way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, taster of Indian classical dance with us as a way on the theme of peace as we hearing Shanti, Shanti, Shanti um, leading us into the discussion this afternoon. Uh, it's my the handheld mics are here because we're wanting to have um, some breakout groups as you can see well, you can't see but they were, were in the program um, after the keynote address and uh, the, the roving mics will be here just so we can um, pick up observations and thoughts as part of our response to the keynote address. OK, 
going to change change microphones. Um, I'm looking for our keynote speaker, Dr. Andy Boaki. Uh, Andy is, as you'll see on the program, a lecturer in the Department of Religions and Theology at the University of Manchester. Andy is a New Testament studies specialist, um, but uh, like many theologians today, teaches much more widely across the curriculum. Uh, if I remember correctly, Andy has also been involved in the, in the research process that, um, that Addy was sharing before lunch. Have I got that right or wrong, Andy? I may have got that wrong. Um, anyway, it is my, it's my great pleasure uh, to be able to introduce Dr. Baaki to us this afternoon and to invite him to give our keynote lecture on this very first Clarkson Day, uh, bearing in mind the interfaith nature of this afternoon on the role of faith communities in tackling racism in, in Greater Manchester and in the UK. So Andy, would you kindly come forward, please? And we welcome you. Thank you very much, Canon Holgate. Um, and thank you as well to the organizing committee for putting uh, this marvelous event on. Um, what Canon Holgate didn't tell you was that I was originally scheduled to do the Indian classical dancing today, uh, but we, 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 we thought we'd leave it to someone else at the last minute. So we're speaking about the role of faith communities in tackling racism in the UK and Greater Manchester. It's a discussion which I hope will continue beyond today. But of course, as we memorialize the incredible work of Thomas Clarkson, it is particularly important that we think about these things uh, today. Christians who've been involved in raising ecological awareness have long noticed something critically important in their own struggle. And I quote here from John Grimm and Mary Evelyn Tucker, who acutely noted the following. What is becoming more self-evident is that the ecological crisis cannot be solved by science, technology, law, politics, or economics alone because we are more aware that environmental and development issues are in large measure social issues. Thus, fixing the environment through technology or regulating development through legislation will not be sufficient. This is where both Grimm and Tucker see religion coming in, because religion highlights, quote, those cosmological stories, symbol systems, as we just saw through the dance, ritual practices, ethical norms, historical processes, and institutional structures that transmit a view of the human as embedded in a world of meaning and responsibility, transformation and celebration. It's this very idea that I believe Thomas Clarkson saw so deliberately, so passionately and so unremittingly. Having been threatened by pro-slavery supporters uh, on the docks in Liverpool, he came and he preached in Manchester's Collegiate Church in 1787, which of course later became the cathedral. Clarkson recalled the experience of delivering that sermon in his work, The History of the Rise, Progress and Accomplishment of the Abolition of the African Slave Trade by the British Parliament in 1808, where he wrote the following. When I went into the church, it was so full that I could scarcely get to my place for notice had been publicly given, though I knew nothing of it, that such a discourse would be delivered. I was surprised also to find a great crowd of black people standing around the pulpit. There might have been 40 or 50 of them. The text that I took as the best to be found in such a hurry was the following. Thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger seeing that you were strangers in the land of Egypt. He's quoting there from Exodus 22, verse 21. Clarkson argued that slavery violated the most fundamental Christian and human principles, and that forcibly removing human beings from their homes, transporting them to foreign countries, and to make them the possessions of other people 
was simply morally unjustifiable. He continued saying the following words uh, in his sermon. If we could have the next slide, please. These are the words uh, of Clarkson's sermon. If then we oppress the stranger, as I have shown, and if by a knowledge of his heart, we find that he is a person of the same passions and feelings as ourselves, we are certainly breaking by means of the prosecution of the slave trade, that fundamental principle of Christianity, which says that we shall not do that unto another, which we wish should not be done unto ourselves. And I fear cutting ourselves off from all expectation of the divine blessing. For how inconsistent is our conduct? We come into the temple of God, we fall prostrate before him, we pray to him that he will have mercy on us. But how shall he have mercy on us who have had no mercy upon others? We pray to him again that he will deliver us from evil. But how shall he deliver us from evil who are daily invading the right of the injured African and heaping misery on his head? Now, even as I read these words, I, I wonder how so clear a truth could have been so obscure to so many, even people within the church. And if today, as faith communities, we are to meaningfully combat racial hatred, prejudice and injustice in our country, then we ought to emulate that spirit of Thomas Clarkson, which is, in my view, the spirit of the early Jesus movement and indeed of Jesus himself. I want to suggest today that the most powerful impact that faith communities can exert on a society is through their example. We're ashamed when people of faith engage in behaviours that demean religious belief. So we should, by the same token, rejoice when our witness reflects divine love into the darkest parts of the human experience. And so I want to share one story from the early church's life adapted from a reading by a theologian and cultural critic called Dominique dubois Gilliard, which demonstrates how even the ancient Jesus movement had to navigate the thorny terrain of ethnic division and how with the same urgency of purpose that we see in Thomas Clarkson, the early church addressed the issues and testified to the unbelieving world. If we could have the next slide, please. Luke records this story in Acts chapter six. Now at this time, as the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint developed on the part of the Hellenistic Jews, that is Greek speaking Jews, against the Hebraic Jews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. you seven men of good reputation full of the spirit and wisdom whom we may put in charge of this task but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word the announcement found approval with the whole congregation and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and Philip Prochorus Nicanor Timon Parmenas and Nicholas a proselyte from Antioch and they brought these men before the apostles and after praying, they laid their hands on them. The word of God kept spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Now God's people have always been called to the sacrificial love of neighbor. As in Luke's parable uh, involving a kind, a, a kind Samaritan, which showed that the definition of neighbor ought to be expansive and not restrictive. This love should be keenly extended to the most vulnerable and those on the margins of the community. Well, here in Acts chapter six, we see the disciples demonstrate this very love by instituting a resource distribution program for widows, a very um, vulnerable cross-section of ancient society. But a problem arises. The widows from two different cultural backgrounds have a very different experience of the program. As Gilead argues, the Hebraic widows were insiders to the church's dominant Jewish culture, customs, and languages, whilst the Hellenistic widows, the Greek-speaking widows, 
were Jews who probably lived most of their lives in Greek-speaking cities and towns outside Jerusalem and who returned to the city as cultural outsiders. And as such, these Hellenistic, these Greek-speaking widows felt as if their outsider status was causing them to be overlooked and marginalized in the church's distribution of provisions. The Hebraic widows had advocates at the table of power, i.e. the Hebraic leaders of the Jerusalem church, as well as cultural and linguistic and relational advantages. And so they were privileged as though they were superior. The Greek speaking widows had neither real representation at the table or in the decision making process, and they had no advocate to recognize their plight and were thus not cared for with the same love and tenderness as their Hebrew speaking sisters. Now, as the text implies, it seems that this oversight was probably unintentional. My own guess is that these Greek speaking widows were women who became uh, members of the Jesus movement uh, after, uh, during the Pentecost. But again, to cite Gilead, once the complaint was raised, the disciples assessed the institutional structure and program. They didn't respond with defensiveness, denial of the problem, or any attempts to cover it up. They assessed the widow's benevolence program, determined that the discrimination claim was a legitimate one, and they established an early church council to oversee the matter. They elected seven men filled with the spirit, all of whom were Hellenists, I think that's interesting, to oversee the problem. And the result, as uh, Luke writes in Acts 6 verse 7, the word of God spread. The church confronted this issue of privilege privilege and discrimination. Outsiders were attracted to the ancient Jesus communities. So I ask then, what can modern faith communities learn? If the church and other faith communities are going to confront inequality and racism in our cities and ultimately in our world, the very first thing we must do is recover the radical egalitarian love that Jesus impressed upon those earliest believers. Privilege, status, and hierarchy were woven into the fabric of imperial life, but the cross was the great leveler. It was the great equalizer of persons. If the incarnate God was executed in a fashion reserved for peasant rebels, then there is no room for big social distinctions in our churches or other faith communities. Our starting point must be that supremacy and domination are anti-truth, anti-peace, and anti-love. Racism flourishes where privilege is tolerated. Remember, it was so-called Christian slaveholders who taught that God had cursed the descendants of Ham, that is all dark-skinned peoples, to be eternally subservient. And that's based on a very warped and confused reading of Genesis 9 25. Continue to privilege white skin today is to buy into that falsehood. And it's not just false morally, if I can put my sort of biblical scholar's hat on for a second, it's false historically and hermeneutically as well, bore you with those details. But with this as a point of departure, I suggest that faith communities can learn three things. If we have the final slide, please. And these are the three things that I want us to think, I may be blocking that for some people. We must firstly model honest self-critique Secondly, we must resist the temptation to depoliticize the gospel. And thirdly, we must recapture radical love. Firstly, then, modeling honest self-critique. The believers that Luke recalled in Acts 6 realized that dominance and privilege had taken hold, and they hit it head on. And remember, it was the 12, Jesus' own inner circle, those that he had handpicked himself, who stopped and said, we cannot allow the Hebrew speaking widows to be privileged over the Greek speaking widows. They witnessed Jesus' ministry themselves. They saw Jesus bring a zealot and a tax collector together. They saw him draw no status distinction between prostitutes, foreigners, and lepers on one hand and the religious elite on the other. And they honestly appraised this widow's program. Their humble, honest, undefensive self critique is what led ultimately to justice in the community. But of course, this has not always been the response of the church. In his Life of an American Slave, 
Frederick Douglass bemoaned the religion of an American church that chose hypocritical comfort and conformity over honest self-critique and radical gospel love when he wrote the following. Between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to receive the one as good, pure and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave holding, women whipping, cradle plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity." End quote. The question for us as communities of faith is whether we will be honest in the appraisal of our own religious and spiritual spaces, owning up to our own deficiencies when voices from the margins cry out for justice. Will we be courageous enough to call out and correct privilege and dominance when it rears its head? As believing people, we cannot demand that society remove the speck from its eye when we have enormous hypocritical planks of wood in our own. Once we seize the initiative to engage theologically with questions of race, listen with patience and sensitivity to the stories of black and minority ethnic members of our communities, and become known for our intolerance of dominance, then we will be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, and our example will be one that is worthy of imitation. And yet this leads smoothly into this second idea. We must resist the temptation to depoliticize the gospel. Every so often, and most recently with the re-emergence of Black Lives Matter rhetoric that we heard last year, I hear Christians saying things like this, Keep politics out of the gospel. Our job is to save souls and not to engage in social justice. I even heard one person recently say to me that Jesus was not a politician. Now I get that intentions Christians don't want other Christians squabbling over affiliations. That all makes sense. However, that's very different from discipleship to Christ and the pursuit of social justice of social justice ever was exclusive. Luke is very specific about the problem that faced showing that indeed their lives are informed by it. Remember, it was the 12, those 12 people who walked with the Messiah himself, who recognized the importance of rectifying ethnic privilege within the community. And thank goodness that their understanding of Jesus and his mission was not detached from social realities. And if we as people are to have a hope of tackling racism in our own communities as people of faith, then ours cannot be either. Thirdly and finally, we must embrace radical love. Imperial society was very highly class conscious. And though there was mobility between the classes, people generally knew their place in ancient Roman society. You had patricians, senators, and equestrians who formed a kind of aristocratic class and then the closest thing to a middle class perhaps were the commons, and then you had the peasantry, slaves and freed people at the lowest rung of the social ladder. And then into this world came this odd Jewish sect, the Jesus movement, 
that cared for widows and embraced peasants and the nobility uh, in the same way. This was a group who, ironically, given the present circumstances, were known for staying in the city when pandemics broke out, like the Plague of Cyprian, uh, which the Christian Cyprian wrote about, which is why it's called the Plague of Cyprian, when upwards of 5,000 people were dying in the city of Rome every day. The pagan emperor Julian wrote to his high priest in Galatia about this weird sect of people that followed this, this crucified Jew and about how they stayed in the city during the outbreak of this ancient pandemic, not only helping their own sick, but helping all the sick. This radical gospel love was inexplicable to Roman sensibilities. When Paul wrote to his colleague and convert Philemon, welcome the renegade slave Onesimus back as a brother, this signaled a total reconfiguration of the imperial status quo. Slave and slave master living as brothers. Try to imagine that even in the days of the transatlantic slave trade. Slave master and slave living together and treating one another as equal and as family. Tom Wright concluded that if Philemon were the only New Testament document to ever have existed, that we would still have to conclude that something fairly remarkable had happened in the first third of the first century of the Common Era. And it's precisely this kind of countercultural, status quo disturbing, Christ-centered, radical love that challenges and changes the social landscape. There are racially divided communities in the UK and certainly in the Northwest of England. Churches, synagogues, mosques and temples must be those spaces in our urban and rural settings which buck the trend of racial division and demonstrate how difference and diversity is cause for celebration and for championing understanding. Speaking divided a community might be along racial, ethnic, or class lines, the church has to be a place and radical love rest. For his famous love poem in 1 Corinthians 16, he wrote, and I will now show you the way when the church to become the platform of dialogue between those that most excellent way, human sisterhood and, and of radical love. When I heard relatively recently of a black man being turned down for a curacy post in the Church of England because the demographic of the parish was, quote, white working class, part of my frustration was in how the church chose the comfort of the status quo over the social dis of radical love. Just as the 12 chose not to opt for the Greek schools and Jews prostitute, the leper, the tax collector, and the foreigner, the church seeking brace radical even in the most racially uncertain contexts. Now, as a Christian and as a humble law, what on earth would the church be if his mission were to seek if Martin Luther King and Desmond Tutu chose our world would be. Though William Wilberforce usually get lobbied for the abolition of slavery for almost 50 years alongside Wilberforce. The great romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge described Clarkson as the moral steam engine of abolitionism. Clarkson was someone who was unafraid to critique the church of his day, honestly and humbly. He was someone who refused to divorce the gospel from social justice, and he was clearly someone who embraced the most radical gospel love. 
Today, as we reflect on his legacy and remember his contribution to the struggle, I want us also to reflect on his discipleship, a discipleship of courageous resistance. And as we talk over these ideas in groups, I want us to carefully consider how we might internalize the spirit of this great prophet. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. You've set the agenda for the next little period of our afternoon. We've got just over an hour uh, set aside till four o'clock is our cutoff point this afternoon. Uh, and, uh, and we're wanting to arrive at a point when we can make an act of commitment about our response to the need for justice, equality and inclusion for all. Um, so we need to travel from where we are to that point. And we'd like to invite you, uh, there's no compulsion, if you want to take a little walk or a little breather, um, uh, Nierthia will be dancing again at quarter past three. But if you'd like to, we, we, we'd invite you to just chat to your neighbor or move the chairs around, they're not pushed together too closely, and, and have a conversation uh, with somebody else, somebody you don't know, perhaps, on one of these, on one or more of these three challenges, because I think uh, the simplicity of Andy's presentation uh, belies the depth of the challenge. And so I invite us, thinking about our own faith communities or hearing about another faith community that's not familiar to us, um, let us reflect on these. The question is, in what way does my faith community uh, model honest self-critique? In what way does your faith community resist the temptation to depoliticize? Now, the gospel is Christian language, um, but depoliticize, let us say, that what Thomas Clarkson used in his sermon, I wouldn't want to do to others what I wouldn't want them to do to me, the negative version of the golden rule. And then, firstly, uh, of course, the heart of uh, the Torah and the Gospel and other faiths, and that is radical love for the other. So will you do so? And I've got a roving microphone under my chair, and I'll call us back together probably in about 15 minutes or so, and then we can hear what your thoughts are on one or other of these questions.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to interrupt. I do apologize for interrupting what are conversations that are clearly very fruitful. There's a thoughtful quietness about the conversations that I think is indicating depth. But we need to move on. What we'd like to do at this point is see if we can have a comment from each, one comment from each of the groups, just reflecting something of what you've been discussing. Okay, so uh, Stephen's going to come round to each of the groups, my colleague Stephen, and just uh, give that microphone to somebody who clearly won't be able to summarize everything, but just uh, play. So, Stephen, do, I think, just nobble this first group and then we'll go around. Well, thank you, Roger, for nominating me. Uh, our discussion was about privilege and very much about uh, gender as well. Because if you look at uh, uh, faith organizations, historically, all the apostles, uh, dis disciples were all male. Um, and certainly in my faith, it's very much a gender issue. And that gender gives those, the men the power to control and actually keep the, 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 the females down. And I think the thing is that if they, women were brought forward, they would be much, much more, certainly I experienced it with myself with, when they lead the prayers, when they do things, they do it in a way where they're very uh, encouraging, very, I was going to use the word passionate, well not passionate, very softly and gently and take everybody with them. Whereas, uh, men always, well, I certainly feel like if I always have the power, and I shouldn't, I need to change myself first of all, really. Thank you, Christian. Can we move on to the next group, please? <laughs> this is very sexist. Anyone else want to say something? Um, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. There is an element of that, isn't there? Um, he says, still holding the microphone. Uh, um, I think one of the key issues we were looking at was about challenge. Um, and when we identify racism, when we identify practices that are not welcoming and not enabling, um, to try and find ways of challenge. Um, not confrontational, but to try and make it in terms of um, a way that, you know, use the position we may have or just the opportunity to say something, to make a suggestion, even to say, I don't feel comfortable with that um, or I don't like that. Just I'll try and find a way forward to bring people with us, sort of thing as um, sort of we were saying there. But, uh, and there are a few different ideas, so, but that's about it. Great. Okay. Oh, do I have to stand up? <laughs> For me, when I've done some of this work in the past as a youth worker and um, doing anti-racist training with other white people, for me, it's about having those allies who are from the white community, but also giving space to have these conversations and doing it in quite a structured way, but in ways that allow people, white people who are coming out with the racist stuff, to be honest, about what they're really thinking, but then to have space to converse and understand that actually a lot of that might be based in ignorance, it might be based in habit, it might be based on things like, my dad believes that, so that's what I believe. I grew up here doing this, so that's what I do. And what we found when I was doing that work, gosh, it was a while ago, but that actually there are very, good constructive ways that you can challenge it without people feeling put down or feeling um, belittled and that they actually move into some other understanding and that's the change we want to see isn't it when people suddenly start thinking oh I was wrong that isn't right what, what I believe so that was my thought thank you thank you the next group 
Can I address Andy's um, work on scripture there, on Acts chapter 6? Um, you uh, rightly used that as an example. Sorry? Stand up. Um, you use, use that as an example. But it seems to me the whole thing actually is about empowerment and leadership. Because Acts 6 then moves into the rest of Acts. Luke gives two whole chapters to Stephen, who is one of those seven, and he becomes martyred. Then we read about Philip, another one of those people who's not serving cups of tea or doing the food bank. He's actually baptized Ethiopian eunuchs. And then later on, we discover that he's miles and miles away from Jerusalem, and he's got seven daughters who prophesy, hence the also the gender thing. Seems to me that a key part of what Luke is saying in that passage actually is the shift is empowerment from leadership from the 12 to a new generation. And they actually are the ones who are showing a, a, the way forward. So maybe actually the empowerment for leadership is actually one which actually benefits the whole. Thank you. That's really helpful and connects with Addy's presentation before lunch. The next group. The reluctant reporter there. Sister, we look forward to hearing your report. <laughs> your. My group looked at um, modern on his self-critique and uh, recapturing that uh, radical love. And Could you I, just speak a little louder so we can hear, thanks. Okay, and uh, what we were discussing is that if we are honest with ourselves first, then as a church, as a collective, then we are able to move on and really get a grip in terms of racism. So I gave an example and I said, I always look inward before I can look outward. So I just said to them that early this week we were at a civic event and there were seven or so black persons at my table and one individual was white. And I, as I was listening to the speakers, um, I saw this gentleman that sat behind me. I believe that he was uncomfortable. No one was speaking to him. And I put myself in his position. If I was sitting at the table with just all white persons, how would I have felt? And then I turned behind and I spoke to him, never realizing that uh, he was one of the key speakers because I've never met him before. And he was a prominent doctor managing four hospitals in Manchester. But at the end, he located me and he said, thank you uh, for acknowledging me. And for me, that is something that I would have wanted for myself. So each one of us here this evening can make a difference you have to become uncomfortable to be comfortable. And as you look inward, then you are able to shape the community, your church around you. And I believe that as we move forward, we can give that radical love. I want to be loved just as I want to love others. Um, but sometimes we go into a, um, a place where we are uncomfortable. And when you sit in that uncomfortability, then you know what it is to be comfortable comfortable from others' perspective as well. That's me. Thank you very much. One, there's one last group here. Or, or is it two? Is it, were you one together? Uh, thank you very much. As we gathered in our group, we said each of us has a story, a story to share, and each of us experienced and faced some sort of discrimination in this journey. So every story is unique and every story is important. The second thing, as we discussed, we thought was, as Andy mentioned, racism flourishes when privilege is tolerated. And therefore, to pick up that intolerance towards privilege. And we need a space for dissent. How do we nurture that space for dissent in our moving forward? And then we also spoke about prejudice, how people are prejudiced. And they already make an opinion before even you come to make a point. So. As faith communities, it is important that we address prejudice as well. And finally, we also said how important it is for faith, all faiths, to have a public relevance. Unless we have a public relevance, faith becomes too narrow, and therefore we, 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 we start building, constructing walls. But if it has to be radical love, it is about breaking down all kinds of walls. Walls that are built in the name of gender, color, caste, creed, uh, and sexuality as well. So unless we break down all these walls, radical love is not uh, seen as a practical thing. So that was what we have discussed, and I hope my sisters would agree when I said it. Yeah. Thanks.
Thank you. Let's give one another an applause for the, for the thought that's gone on. This is just the tip of the iceberg, tiniest piece of, of what we've been talking about. I'm just going to glance at my program and see where we are in terms of time. I'd be amazed if we were on time. We're only five minutes behind time, actually, which I give each other another big clap because we've been, we've been working really hard. We, we are drawing, as I say, uh, towards the end of the program. But the, the plan now is to invite Nirthya to come and introduce us to some Bollywood style dancing. And I know she'll feel very bad if we don't participate. So just warning you about that. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I'm sure everyone here has seen a little bit of Bollywood dancing. I'm sure you have. Um, so it's basically just um, dancing which comes, yes, there you are, we've got some action going on here. Um, but it started us off with influences, it's not just one particular style of dance. You've got influences from classical, semi-classical, folk, hip-hop, belly dancing, um, it's got everything. So I'm just going to go a little, little, little display of it first, and then we'll run through moves, I think. You've all been sitting down for too long. You need to get up and move, I think. So I'll show you how it's done first, and you're all going to do it with me after. Chitty at the line, yard, it, up it, 
Two very short.
just a few weeks ago I was privileged to go to Ghana and um, I went to a place called um, Elimina Castle and I don't know if anybody's heard of it um, in Ghana so it was a former hub of a slave trade in Ghana and I walked into this castle this ruined castle um, still very much the rooms are kind of like intact Absolutely horrific what I saw and the thing that really really got me is there was a room um, where white people that had done wrong were placed into this room and it was on the outside of the castle so there was like a window you could breathe um, and those people were kept in captive there for some time but next door to that which was in there was a room where black people were held and there was no window people were held in this space they couldn't breathe, they were there to die. And one by one, these people were removed from this space. And these people died. And the man pointed out to this, the scratchings on the wall, there was all these scratchings of the people trying to get out on the wall. You could actually see them. It was absolutely awful. And then we saw, you know, the rooms where women were taken, where women were um, selected, overlooking from the white masses at the top, looking down, to select women to have sex with them. Many of them had babies in those most inhumane conditions. So I kind of left there and I was quite, you know, really, really moved by it. But as I say, really humbled to have seen and witnessed where my brothers and sisters were actually held there in those circumstances. So institutional religion was and is an important identity source for black people in general, even though it was, um, not for Du Bois himself, I make lots of reference to W.E.B. Du Bois. He was a sociologist who studied black American life and an activist who was one of the most important black protest leaders in the United States during the first half of the 20th century. And he clearly experienced racial discrimination and abuse based on his color, but he formed a social identity that wasn't based on religion, but it was based on race. 
However, as Andy points out again, Dubois talks about how religious institutions gave comfort, social cohesion, and a collective identity of their own to black people, who were still, and a centuries later, an oppressed minority. The notion of whiteness, as defined by the colonists, can only be meaningful through the construction of blackness. So blackness, you know, and um, it's the basis for white privilege. Um, and that was afforded to white people who were actually seen as being given a psychological wage for being white, whereas black people were taxed for being black. And I look at this in terms of health and I can see how you know, that black racial tax really impacts upon people's health today. And also, um, Andy makes reference to, um, you know, the teachings about supremacy and domination, which goes against all that is good, and on quotes, flourish where privilege is tolerated. He also highlights how Christian slaveholders were taught that dark-skinned people of Ham were to be cursed and substandard. How inhumane this could be interpreted as such to justify slavery and ill treatment of others. Um, there's a real significance of race, religion, and, and um, in the black church. And Dubois identifies the black Negro church as representing a freedom that black people could call their own and one that survived slavery. So I'm going to skip a few because I've actually taken a lot longer than I thought I was going to take. So I'm, so, I'm going to skip some of what I um, was going to say. Um, and I just want to make reference to the impact that race has on the health of black people. Um, so I, as I, said, I make a lot of reference to Dubois. I also make reference to, to Frank Fanon as well, and the construction of race and the legacy of slavery itself. How he talks about the chronic impact of inferiorization that is evidence of deep-rooted effects of slavery and the trauma that that causes to people. And I talk about this interaction of genes with the environment and nature and how it can produce more ill health and disease, causing epigenetic effects to the health of those affected. And I look at things like stress, those chronic stressors, you know, that can be transmitted from the mother to the fetus. Um, during the prenatal period. And some of the evidence has gone beyond that to identify the long-term and intergenerational trauma of stress resulting from slavery. And so how can we justify this? When we look at some of the data that's out there, and it was just until December 2020, where black women were five times more likely to die during pregnancy. They say, oh, it's four times now, four times more likely now. It's just just under five times more likely um, to die during pregnancy or as a result of their pregnancies. But also that black women are 40% more likely to have a miscarriage. This is no coincidence. If you think back to the impact of slavery, we can see how these things happen. We can see the profound effect, impact on physical and mental health, lower life expectancy, higher blood pressure, higher supposedly threshold to pain. A lot of this goes back to that time. Global reality, and we can see it existing in many, many forms. Um, but I just want to mention as well, Andy's asked us to kind of almost prick our consciousness about how we see ourselves um, in the church. And when I look back and read about how black people were accepted or not accepted in the, in the churches um, when they came over, in large numbers through Windrush, where are the Christian principles and Christian values in those kind of uh, questions? So, as I said, I'm not going to go on for any much longer than that, um, but just really to say that race, religion, and racism, and I've done so much challenging around this, challenge the likes of my, Michael Marmot and people to say, we need to get racism on there in terms of its impact upon health. Um, the Black Church is an absolutely amazing forum in which to disseminate health messages, but there are also issues as well that we do need to grapple with within the church. So um, I'm just going to end there, but um, I can't give you more on the health disparities, but hopefully we can have a discussion at some point, you know, in the future about some of the real impacts of health um, on, on our communities. But thank you for listening.
Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Faye, uh, for that response. Such an important um, topic. Uh, so as David uh, already said, I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Manchester. Uh, firstly, let me say a word of thanks to Dr. Andrew Boacci for such an insightful and important paper that he's given us today. Dr. Boacci has touched on many themes that are crucial for us to take away uh, and move forward with in the work of racial justice. Uh, and I'm very grateful to be given the opportunity to respond to such a paper in this momentous occasion of the first Clarkson Day here at the Cathedral. The task of my research is to critically evaluate the public theology of Manchester Cathedral. And I've been doing this project for about two years now. And it's an honor today for me to present for the first time in many ways, some of my thinking as it's been formed in the last two years in working with the cathedral. So disclaimer, uh, the cathedral team may not agree with everything I'm gonna to say today, but this is my uh, interpretation uh, of this place as I've been reading and thinking uh, the last couple of years. So that's my little disclaimer. So in response to Dr. Boachi's paper, I'd like to pick up on the three challenges that he set forth and how I see them intersecting with the cathedral's work which will hopefully provide insights for us all today. And I hope for those of you who are not part of the Christian faith, you'll be able to make connections to your own faith traditions and communities as we think together about the fight against racial injustice. So firstly, Dr. Babachi has highlighted that religious institutions need to engage in honest self-critique and be honest in the appraisal of our own religious and spiritual spaces, owning up to our deficiencies when voices from the margins cry out for justice. This year, Father Jarrell Robinson Brown published a book called Black, Gay, British, Christian, Queer, The Church and the Famine of Grace, which I highly recommend to everybody. In the book, Robinson Brown highlights that one of the areas of intersectionality between racism and the exclusion of LGBTQ plus people is found in the institutional church's tendency to interpret, categorize, and subsequently treat differently groups within the community. Robinson Brown writes this, quote, the church proclaims God's love for all while simultaneously practicing a form of drip down grace anomics, dividing God's children between those who can immediately bask in the joy of God's love and those who must change and transform beyond all recognition before the love of God can truly be theirs. We are divided as the deserving and the undeserving, the pure and the impure, the good and the bad, and the well-behaved, the naughty, the saint and the sinner, both frequently and shamelessly, end quote. This tendency to divide and distinguish between individuals characterized by certain shared characteristics is at the heart of both racism and LGBTQ plus exclusion in the church and beyond. Therefore, as part of our honest self-reflection, we must not only critique our actions, which bring so much suffering and exclusion, but we need to even revise our doctrines, narratives, traditions, and practices which have made these actions not only possible, but intelligible for the church to commit. Such theological revision is the work of repentance. And I believe that part of that repentance to take place, we must place those voices that are so often marginalized and excluded, people of color, women, and members of the LGBTQ plus community as the most dominant voices in that discussion. It's not enough to be inclusive without significant transformation taken place to the centers of power. Because as the philosopher, the womanist philosopher Emily Towns reminds us, include, inclusion does not guarantee justice. From my study of the cathedral, it seems to me that the cathedral recognizes the harm that white heteronormative patriarchal theology has caused historically to those outside the centers of power. As a result, the cathedral focuses on activity which resists the effects of this theology but I wonder if more needs to be done to revise and articulate an alternative theological teaching in the, recognize that the, in the recognition that the institutional church's fail, historical and present failure is also a failure of its theology. Our God talk isn't good enough. The theological teachings of the church have, not been good, have often not been good news for those who find themselves outside of the white patriarchal and heteronormative framework that these teachings uphold. So the question for the cathedral and the other religious institutions represented here is how can we deconstruct and rebuild our teachings in a way that they are good news for the marginalized? And this leads us nicely to the second point of Dr. Boachi's paper, where he's urged us to resist the temptation to depoliticize the gospel. Dr. Boachi has shown that engagement with social movements such as Black Lives Matter does not distract from the gospel and the mission of the church 
but embodies it. And I think part of the problem with sentiments such as keep politics out of church is that we don't recognize that our religions are political and that such a statement in itself is political and not just religious. Um, we, often we reduce politics to simply statecraft, i.e. what the government does and what I can do to affect the government, such as voting. But actually politics is much broader because it's about the everydayness of our lives as we make decisions about our place and other people's places within it. So both politics and religion are about helping us understand who we are, who others are, what the world is about, and how we should act accordingly. The theologian Stanley Hauerwas has this mantra that I've taken for myself. It says, you can only act in the world that you can see, but you can only see by learning to say. What he's getting at with this statement is that the, word, the way we experience the world is formed by the way we learn to speak about the world. And the way that we learn to speak about the world is given to us by language in our culture and the traditions that we are formed within. So when we attend a choral even song or attend a service at the local synagogue, gurdwara, mosque, or other places of worship, we can ask of ourselves, how is this practice and how are these words forming me to act within the world? How is it shaping my sight and understanding of the world and those around me? Let me just give you a little parable just to illustrate this. There's two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way. And the older fish nods at the two young fish and says, how's the water boys? The two young fish carry on swimming. One turns to the other and says, what is water? Now, you may be wondering at this point, what does this have to do with racial justice? Well, the question is, what is the water that we are swimming in? Often, uh, for those of us who identify as white, we don't see how our world is racially constructed. We're blind to it. And we need to ask ourselves, what is the water? And I think that one of the way, major ways that we can attend to this task of seeing how our world is racially constructed is, again, to enter into deep relationships with those who are marginalized because the reason they're marginalized is because they don't fit with a particular imagined vision of how the world is supposed to be. Again, this is a space where racism and LGBTQ exclusion intersect because both are dependent on particular people being excluded because they don't fit within a culturally imagined norm. So thirdly and finally, Dr. Bawachi has shown us that we must embrace radical love. I find love to be a difficult concept from my experience because many individual, religious individuals that I encounter have such a wide understanding of what love is that, it's, that even the most harmful and exclusionary practices can be labeled as living. We've probably all experienced at some point in our lives someone saying, I am doing or saying this because I love you, as the person then proceeds to do or say something that does not conform to any reasonable definition of love. In regards to the topic of racism that we're discussing today, we all heard the responses to the chants of Black Lives Matter. We all heard somebody somewhere say, whether in person or online, well, I believe that all lives matter. Thus, when I hear Dr. Boachi saying we must embrace radical love, I can hear a hypothetical opponent responding, probably on Facebook or Twitter, well, yes, but we should love everybody equally. So we need to ask the question, what is love? Manchester Cathedral, I think, sets an example and as it desires to demonstrate and embody an, embody an inclusiveness in love that seeks to empower those who lack power and bring people in who've previously been marginalized. In a multitude of ways, the cathedral, clergy, chapter, and volunteers don't seek the comfort of the status quo, but continually try to break down walls and build bridges. It asks who is missing and why are they missing? I think that Manchester Cathedral is such a place where the marginalized are brought in and can increasingly be a space and model for all of us as we move forward. So finally, let me just say, if we're to work according to what we've heard today, all the challenges, I think the road ahead is gonna be long and difficult, just as it always has been. There will be those inside our communities and outside who are resistant to the work of liberation. But may we who are called to fight for such things be reminded of Dr. Vowachi's words today. If Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu, and Thomas Clarkson chose comfort over radical love, our world would be a deeply impoverished place. Thank you.
Thank you, Faye. Thank you, Dominic, for your responses. We've come to the end of our day, and we're going to invite Dean Rogers to lead us in a very, very simple act of commitment. Before I do that, can I just say how good the day's been? It's been a stretching day, I hope, a day of challenge, a day of thoughtfulness, reflection, but most importantly, action is needed. Somebody said very recently, we, we, we just spend too much time with words. Now, theologians and clergy of all sorts love words, but we must make sure that words are followed by transformational action. We want to see less stroke, no racism in our midst, in our communities, in our faith communities, in our streets and in our institutions. We want every person, black, white, green or blue, or even if you have gray hair like Stephen, to be treated fairly equally as God's beloved children. Can I say thank you to David for all of his work in pulling this day together? To thank you, David. Can we give David a round of applause? Bollywood comes to Manchester. Nithya, thank you so much. It's been marvelous to have you participate. All of our stall holders, many of them have gone home. One is poised to leave the cathedral as soon as we do the act of commitment. Thank you, Elizabeth, and all of the others who've had stalls here sharing your work. Uh, to those, yes, indeed, thank you. We've never had these sort of events sort of filmed like we have had today. Uh, thank you, Khan, Charles, and the film crew. It's going to be on BBC News tonight, so watch the six o'clock news when you go home. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> to Bev Hughes, who spoke during the day, to Addy, who spoke to us about the churches general slow tortoise-like movement on racism. Thank you, Addy, for speaking to us about the task group report. Thank you also, Faye and Dom, for your responses. How can we not end the day by saying thank you to our keynote speaker, Andy? Your, your talk was absolutely inspirational. <laughs> And it's great that we have you in our city. We must make more use of you in a way to inspire us, to lead us forward, because we need brothers and sisters like you. So thank you, Andy, for all that you shared with us. And thank you to each and every one of you for coming. Uh, I forgot to mention, we said thank you to those who provided our food at lunchtime. Thank you again for that. And yes, let's give them a round of applause. And lastly, thank you, one and all. As Desmond Tutu would say, clap yourself for coming today. A little simple, would, would you like to stand as we say these very simple words? I know they're words, but let's, let's say them uh, deeply and meaningfully as we commit ourselves. We commit ourselves to challenging all forms of racism in Greater Manchester as we work together for justice, equality, and inclusion for all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a safe trip home, everybody. It's been lovely to see folks I've not seen for a while uh, here today. Robin, lovely to see you and many others. Thank you very much for being here in person today. Take care, everybody. <laughs>